Okay, so um, we're going to talk today about uh, aviation and subsidies uh, in the European Union. Um, so we are going to introduce uh, the the two organizations that um, organize this uh, this webinar, uh, Stay Grounded and Humanoterra. And then we will go through a conceptual introduction about what is a subsidy um, and then have an um, overview of direct and, um, and indirect subsidies in aviation, mostly at the European level, to uh, then dig into the national level with um, some theory first, uh, and then some uh, examples from mainly from Central and Eastern European countries. And as I mentioned already, uh, we will end the webinar with a moderated discussion with three um, topics, um, question to the speaker, so general questions, but also strategic questions and topic um, related to subsidies that you would like to see in other webinars, uh, next webinars. Um, and then if you want also to share examples of subsidies from your countries, you're also very welcome to do so um, during that time. So I'm going to end on to Mira now uh, to introduce Stay Grounded, and then we will uh, have also a, a small introduction from Humanoterra. Yeah, thanks so much. So my name is Mira. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Stay Grounded. I'm doing network coordination for Stay Grounded, and I'm very excited um, about this collaboration today and about this connection of different actors who have a common interest because this is also what Stay Grounded is all about. And yeah, I have the honor to shortly present Stay Grounded, but I will do it really briefly since many of you also know it or are part of Stay Grounded. So Stay Grounded was founded um, back in 2016 from Vienna, both from the local fight against the airport expansion there and from the concerns about the global climate plans of the sector within the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO. But obviously you cannot found a network alone. So from the beginning onwards, it was the connection of several groups who built this network um, and some of them having been in the fight for, for up to decades before. And what started with this um, loose alliance has now become a global network of more than 200 member organizations. Um, who are very diverse, but they are all united by the goal of a just reduction of aviation and the wish to exchange about it, support each other, and also sometimes campaign together on this when it makes sense. And um, the very critical um, stance on false solutions. So um, from the beginning onwards, we were also like countering uh, the idea of offsetting and agrofuels for aviation. And we have regional networks, like the most active ones in Europe and in Latin America. Um, in Europe, there are most of our members, but also a lot of them are in Western Europe. So we are also still very much open for new members. And I will also share a link how what it really means to become a member um, later in the chat. But what the network basically does is um, doing coordinated campaigns together, like currently on the um, ban of private chats or other topics such as greenwashing and just transition. And these campaigns are often also um, prepared by um, working groups. So we have content working groups on different issues such as greenwashing or caps and limits of airports. We also have an educational program where there's currently um, very soon the next training upcoming on um, the issue of aviation and climate justice and how to communicate about it. I will also share the invitation for that because you can still register if you want to. And yeah, the, the network is basically um, about connecting each other. So this is also what members often feedback that this is very valuable to have this kind of sharing of expertise and information and mutual support. So we do that via regular meetings online and offline and also other means of communications. And we also organize webinars such as this one today. So with that, I will also already end and hand back to the webinar facilitation. Yeah. 
you're still muted, Lunas. Yeah. <laughs> Um, thank you. Thanks a lot, Mira. Uh, then I can already end to you, Jonas. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, I will also start my part uh, with introducing myself and our organization because many of you I don't know, some of you I do know. Uh, yes, my name is Jonas Sonnenschein. I'm working for Uma Nautera, the Slovenian Foundation for Sustainable Development. I have a background in environmental economics. And in the NGO sector, I have worked mainly on, or oh, long time on budgeting issues, green budgeting, environmentally harmful subsidies, and so on. Um, Uma Nautera uh, is one of the leading uh, Slovenian NGOs in the environmental sector. So we have a wider array of topics. Uh, we're also a registered research organization, so we've done lots of research in this field of green budgeting, harmful subsidies, and so on. Um, we are also internationally active, so we are we are part of Can Europe, Climate Action Network Europe, EEB, and also Stay Grounded. Um, within Slovenia, we are coordinating a network of, uh, I think, 37, 38 uh, environmental NGOs, so that we try, just like the European network organizations, we try to bundle our voices to have a better say uh, towards policymakers. What I can say is that we have a lot of experience with harmful subsidies, green budgeting. We have a lot of experience with advocacy work, also coordinating advocacy work. We're maybe not uh, the, the, the leading organization on the field of aviation when it comes to content. But I've been active in this field for, for some years, so a little bit I also know. I just added, uh, for the fun of it, our environmental footprint of our organization, because we also want to walk the talk. And you can see, for example, in the year 2015, that our footprint of the organization spiked up. And this is because we had to take a flight, <laughs> I can say, to sign a contract. Otherwise, we have a quite rather strict travel policy uh, to avoid flying. Now, the uh, Central and Eastern Europe part, uh, we are working in an OIKI project, uh, the European Climate Initiative of the German uh, Ministry for the Environment and Climate, uh, and it's on the efficient allocation of EU funds. So here we really look at EU funding and how to use it in a better way and also avoid uh, environmentally harmful projects. Ten partners from eight uh, Central and Eastern European countries, uh, some of them also luckily in the call today, and I think aviation is one of the issues where uh, national but also EU funding is, is sometimes used for very harmful projects. Yes, having said that, I think I will move on to the content uh, and just give a brief conceptual overview of aviation subsidies. Then we move into the European field and then I come back with national examples. Um, definitions are boring, I anyways put one. There are many definitions of subsidies. I like this one because it has three aspects uh, that I want to cover in the presentation. A subsidy is a direct or indirect payment, economic concession or privilege granted by a government to private firms, households or other governmental units in order to promote a public objective. So what do we have in here? We have an instrument, so how the subsidy is granted. We have a beneficiary that could be a private firm, a household, but, but even also another governmental unit or a publicly owned company, and we are some sort of objective. And here I would um, maybe extend that a little bit. We don't just have an objective, but we also have an impact of the subsidy. And the objective is to, to have a certain impact, but there might be some non-desired impacts of the subsidy. And with that, I also want to start. So if we look at uh, harmful subsidies in the aviation sector, um, we can have a harmful impact, we can have a neutral impact, and it's very questionable whether we actually can have with any subsidies in the sector also a green or beneficial impact. What I copied here is actual examples for this classification uh, from the EU sustainable finance taxonomy. This taxonomy is growing all the time. Currently, there are only examples for airports, but with a uh, delegated act that was agreed in the summer, in June, there will also be uh, concrete criteria for manufacturing and leasing of aircraft, passenger and freight air transport, air transport ground handling. So basically a, a large chunk of the aviation value change will, will be covered by the sustainable finance taxonomy. Now for our purposes, I think um, 
for future work also on this topic. Uh, maybe it's interesting to get involved into the definition of what is actually green here, because we might not agree, for example, already with this uh, definition that zero tailpipe CO2 operation of aircraft is enough to qualify as green because there are other emissions and other uh, um, global warming impacts than only CO2. And also the tailpipe is not what is important, but the whole uh, life cycle is important. But just to give you an idea, there are already some some uh, criteria. Um, and I don't want to go into details just to, to say that this, this exists. But I think now we look at the current system as it is, and it's largely harmful. So whatever we subsidize in the current aviation system, I would argue is harmful. Now, uh, this is taken from a paper by Gersley and colleagues from 2017, where we have on the left hand side different instruments, and then we'll get back to that. And at the top, we have uh, the different beneficiaries. So who could benefit from subsidies? And this goes all the way from research and development in aircraft uh, suppliers of parts. Uh, then once the aircrafts are built, air traffic control, airports, airlines. So we have the whole chain. Everybody can be in one way or the other um, uh, subsidized here. When it comes to the instruments, very often um, the classification of subsidy instruments follows um, something that has been initially developed by the World Trade Organization because the whole idea of subsidies came in through the trade, so we should not distort trade, uh, therefore we shouldn't subsidize, and only later the, has the whole uh, classification of subsidies then also been applied to different contexts, like in our case the context of doing environmentally harm, environmentally harmful subsidies. And here, I also don't want to go into the details. I just want to highlight, because we will have many examples, both from the EU and then from national uh, uh, cases, that subsidies are not only direct transfers of grants, of loans, of credits, but very often they come in more indirect forms. That could be tax expenditures. That means we grant a tax reduction, tax exemption, tax refund, and so on. So where we don't fully tax aviation as we tax other sectors or other modes of transport. Or the government is providing a good or a service. Uh, we'll also have examples for that below price, uh, below market price, or even for free. Um, and then all kinds of direct uh, price supports where you, where you subsidize maybe even the purchase of air tickets or there are different, different ways to, to directly subsidize. Um, Okay, and I think um, there's only one more aspect before going into actually the examples from Europe and from national governments. Um, one important aspect that is missing from many of these classification of subsidies are unpriced externalities. So these are all the environmental impacts that are not yet covered with some sort of taxation or fee or whatever. And when it comes to aviation, I think the main externalities are climate change, which is sometimes partly priced, but uh, I think most of us agree not at all uh, close to enough. Uh, air pollution, noise, and then when it comes to the development of airports, very often also the use of land. Um, there are some studies of fossil fuel subsidies, and uh, the most well-known is the one by the International Monetary Fund, that for the first time also included in the analysis externalities. Uh, they come up with much larger figures for uh, worldwide fossil fuel subsidies in the trillions of, of, of dollars uh, compared to, to other studies that only look at the direct and indirect subsidies that are granted through grants, tax exemptions, and so on. So in this IMF study for the first time on a bigger uh, scale, one international organization actually started using externalities. There's an interesting study by Sobekul and colleagues from 2021. It's a matter study. So they didn't do any own research, but they just looked what is the uh, research that is out there on externalities of different modes of transport. And they compared the range of monetized externalities. So they in these studies, uh, researchers try to put a monetary value on the externality, on climate change, air pollution, on the health impact of air pollution and noise and so on, and came up with uh, very different estimates. 
Now here you see that both aviation and road have, have the highest externalities in, compared to rail transport or, or waterborne transport. Um, having said that also, of course, we have to consider that externalities here in the road transport also include health externalities from accidents and so on. So um, that's why maybe road transport also sometimes has a very high externality as compared to aviation. So. Of course, this is even more difficult to research than the, the explicit and implicit subsidies um, when, we, when it comes to, uh, to externalities. But it, externalities might not be written in a law somewhere or might not be explicitly stated by, by, by a government, but that doesn't mean they don't have an economic impact. Right? So they have a cost and indirectly subsidize the sector. Cool. Um, I think uh, I would like now to hand over to uh, to my colleague to present the examples from an EU context, and then I come back with uh, national examples for subsidies. Um, yes. Thank you, Jonas. I will just uh, share my screen. Can you see my screen? Perfect. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Roman Morochat from uh, Transport and Environment. Thank you very much for the invitation, first of all, to stay grounded in Manutera. It's a pleasure to meet uh, you know, all your member organization. It's also um, a pleasure to see some of our TNE members uh, in the call in the audience today. So it's a, it's a pleasure. Um, so with my 10 minutes or so, I will try to provide you with an overview of, of subsidies happening at European Union level. Uh, to provide you with a better understanding of how EU instruments work. Um, but first, yes, uh, for those who do not know TNE, uh, I will give you a brief uh, presentation. So TNE is the Federation of uh, the European Federation of Transport and Environment, founded over uh, 30 years ago with one mission to reduce the emission from the transport sector. We have uh, 61 members across 26 countries. Uh, we have six national offices, so the main one being the one in Brussels, uh, but we also um, span across six countries in the UK, France, Spain, Germany, and Italy, and Poland. Um, here's the one, one, one presentation of all our members. And we work uh, covering all transport modes, so uh, ranging from cars to trucks, uh, ships, and, and planes. Uh, we also deal with the key topics related to the topic uh, to the to transport emissions related uh, sustainable finance energy clean cities and climate tools uh, now on my on the presentation regarding subsidies uh, first i should start with one disclaimer is that uh, i will not only refer to european subsidies to the sector but i will also deal with you know uh, state aid and and tax exemptions that are consequences of European rules. Um, so it's it's kind of a broad uh, understanding of, of, of these subsidies. I will also start with two definitions. So I'll, I define direct subsidies as, uh, you know, EU funding or state aid validated by the European Union to the aviation sector. And I define indirect subsidies as all the tax and carbon pricing exemptions which are given to the sector and which is artificially boosting demand and traffic. Uh, and of course, these all these exemptions lead to these absurd uh, results with, uh, for example, a five euro uh, Ryanair flight, which is the result of badly de designed European policies as well. Um, so first of all, delving into the direct um, subsidies. Um, so first of all, state aid. Um, so, so first, state aid uh, are normally prohibited at European level. Uh, it's, it's enshrined in the treaties, and the European Commission is there, notably the almighty DG competition is there to you know, make sure that the, the rules apply. And uh, normally, you know, states cannot provide state aid unless uh, exceptionally justified. Um, but however, during the, 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 the COVID pandemic, um, a, a temporary framework was adopted because, you know, there, there was the pandemic, there was a, you know, a, a looming crisis for the whole area. And so it enabled member states to support their economies with public finance. 
Um, it also concerned aviation because, because uh, flight restrictions, uh, airlines were losing money, they, were, uh, they had very low cash reserves, and they were threatening to, to declare bankruptcy. Um, so as a consequence, governments um, came to the rescue uh, and they provided very generous uh, COVID bailouts. Um, so you have on the right the table making a list of uh, the, 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 benef the recipients with uh, Air France KLM, for example, receiving over 10 billion euros, the Lufthansa Group uh, receiving even more. And uh, overall, the aviation sector received 37 billion uh, euros of state aid during these two years uh, of pandemic. So it just underlines uh, you know, the very favorable position aviation has when it comes to uh, access to public uh, finance. Um, now delving into um, you know, some examples of EU funding. Uh, so also a disclaimer here, it's not comprehensive uh, because there are many, many different streams going on. For example, you have many money, a lot of funding going on through regional policies or cohesion policies um, targeted to regional airports, which uh, receive a lot of funding. But I will um, focus on first the Innovation Fund, which is um, a fund which is uh, a portion of the revenues generated by the European carbon markets. Uh, its goal is to finance projects uh, in low carbon technologies across Europe. So it's, um, it's the European Commission which uh, manages this fund and, it's, um, and it does what we call call for projects and it funds up to 60% of OPEX and CAPEX costs for these projects. Um, the total funding power is 40 billion euros over 10 years. Um, and yes, um, but when I say 40 billion euros, it's um, all sectors combined. So basically, aviation actors have to compete uh, with other sectors to obtain such money. Um, very strangely, actually, in the aviation sector, there are not so many projects which are funded under this uh, fund. Uh, only two projects related to sustainable aviation fuels, one in Norway and the other one in, in Sweden. Uh, then um, another fund called Clean Sky Joint Undertaking, which is funded around um, um, under the Horizon Europe, so uh, the EU's R and D funding uh, program. Um, here, this uh, this program finances um, aircraft manufacturers and startups to develop, you know, innovation and research uh, programs on sustainable aviation. It has a funding power of four point one billion euros over 10 years, and it funds um, you know, both fuel efficiency uh, programs to hydrogen and electric. And, what, and so you have a few examples on the right. And what we have seen uh, is that you know, up until now, it has mainly funded uh, you know, progr programs that um, diminish a bit fuel consumption on, on aircraft, but it does not you know, solve aviation reliance on fossil fuels, uh, which is a huge issue. So we would like to see you know, more focus put, in, put on hydrogen or electric uh, programs. And uh, another one, but that will be quite brief, is Cesar GU. It's another program funded by uh, Horizon Europe, designed to um, promote you know, uh, air traffic control management in Europe to become more efficient and digital. And here, it received some funding around uh, by Horizon Europe, uh, worth 450 million uh, on uh, 53 projects. But now uh, I will focus on you know where most of the subsidies come from, originate from. These are uh, exemptions uh, from you know tax exemptions and carbon pricing exemptions. Um, first of all, carbon pricing or aviation pricing is uh, it plays a fundamental role. Because it 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 uh, it it aims at achieving three things basically: setting, um, applying the polluter pays principle uh, to ensure that you know uh, aviation uh, climate impacts are priced. Secondly, it's it aims at incentivizing airlines to to switch to cleaner fuels and cleaner technologies. And lastly, it's a very powerful revenue raising tool. For member states' uh, budgets, um, this summer at GNI we we published the tax gap reports, which uh, provides an overview of all the 
the taxing uh, taxation instruments uh, at EU level, and we calculated the tax gap. So what we did is we compared two scenarios, the current level of taxation in Europe compared to the scenario where there's no exemption. And we found a tax gap, uh, which is the difference between both. And we found that at EU level, there's a tax gap of 26 billion euros happening every year as a consequence of the all exemptions given to the aviation sector on VAT, kerosene taxation, and carbon pricing through the ETS. Uh, so now I will delve into one of the most um, potentially uh, revenue raising tool, which is value added tax. So as you know, it's a tax which is raised on all um, goods and services in circulation in Europe. Um, member states raise one trillion, around 1 trillion euros every year. Um, so it has a big potential, but in aviation, uh, only domestic flights are taxed uh, by VAT. Intra-European uh, flights and international are exempt and zero rated. Um, so here, pardon my bureaucratic language, but I gave you some references. So there's the uh, VAT directive, which um, provides some provisions. Uh, so member states can either apply a reduced rate uh, on, on, on aviation, or they sim can simply exempt aviation. And where do the exemption come from? It comes from um, when they negotiated the directive, member states agreed that they could keep their historical derogation that were in place before. So if member states exempted international and EU flights, they could still you know, keep it uh, in their taxation policy. Um, so here we listed all the different rates that apply on domestic flights. You see it's very um, diverse, according to, uh, depending on every country. And the total uh, indirect subsidy uh, per year given to the aviation sector as a consequence is 14 billion euros. Then on kerosene taxation. So currently the rules uh, forbid member states to, to tax um, uh, the fuel used on intra-European and international flights. They can only tax domestic flights and private pleasure flights. Um, and also business aviation is also not in the scope. Uh, with the Fit for 55 uh, package, the European Commission uh, came with a proposal to extend the, the ETD, so the, the carbon uh, tourism taxation to all intra-European flights and also with uh, business aviation. But we see that currently the negotiations are, are blocked in the council also because you know, the countries such as the southern uh, member states are, which are reliant on tourism and on aviation in their economy are quite opposed to, to having such a tax at EU level. Um, maybe I also should also uh, underline the Chicago myth, uh, which is polluting the, the, the public debate today uh, with the, the knowledge or the, the belief that uh, taxation on international flights is forbidden by the Chicago Convention, which is absolutely false. What the convention states is that double taxation is forbidden. So member states where the, so the state where a plane will land cannot apply a tax on the fuel on board this aircraft, but nothing prevents them from applying a tax when uplifting a fuel in a, in a, in a, in an aircraft before takeoff. So as a consequence of this uh, exemption at EU level, we'll, we still have a subsidy every year of more than 10 billion uh, euros. And lastly, on carbon on the carbon pricing with the emission trading system. So this is the, the current market, uh, which also includes aviation since 2013. And according to DTS, um, only the emissions from intra-European flights are priced. Um, so in theory, with the ETS, uh, it's a cap and trade system where um, the, 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 the total emissions that can be emitted are capped and um, airlines have to pay for the pay for the pollution they emit every year. However, we see that the ETS aviation is riddled with exemptions. For example, with free allowances, airlines receive up to 50% of their allowances for free. And extra European flights, so the most polluting segments of the market, is exempt. Uh, so they come for nearly 60% of emissions and they are exempted from, from the ETS. Um, and so this, this big problem originates from, you know, at the time when the ETS was agreed on, and intense diplomatic tensions on Europe, uh, airline lobbying, as usual, 
and EU was forced to reduce the scope of DPS to only intra-European flights. And so as a consequence, you can see on the right that um, the effective current price paid by airlines is extremely low. It can be as low as six, six euros per ton for, for Air France Skylab, for example. And so annually, uh, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's a subsidy of 4 billion euros to give into the aviation sector. So why is there a difference between the countries, or the companies? Uh, because it depends on their business model. So, for example, Air France relies on long haul flights as well as Lufthansa, whilst Ryanair is mostly in, in Europe. So that's why they, you see different prices. And with that, I've finished my presentation and I've added some resources if you want to have a further look. And thank you for your attention. Okay, so um, I will take over again, one second. Um, and I think uh, what already became quite clear is um, that many national level subsidies uh, at the same time originate from some EU re regulations. So VAT is a national policy, excise duties are national taxes. Uh, which can be decided but of course they are linked very much to to the eu and even international environment um i would like to go through the different actors now in the in the value chain and, and give some examples on the national level and i i have to say i come from our national perspective and slovenia is an extremely small country and it might be and we have one international airport so it might be a little bit easier to go into the very specific details of subsidies here uh, comparing to bigger member states of the European Union that, that has uh, countless airports and, of course, many more of these subsidies. When it comes to airports, which are um, sometimes even owned by national companies, now, especially in the south and east of Europe, uh, most of them are owned by Fra Fraport because after the financial crisis 2008 and 2009, they were privatized and actually uh, then sold to, to uh, private companies. Uh, having said that, that those were f f one of the few blocks in this uh, value chain that actually made a profit. So in Ljubljana, the airport made a profit when it was sold, and now it is making a profit for, for the private sector. However, how, how is the airport system subsidized? There are many, many different subsidies. It starts with the land where it's built. It can be sold for free or given away for free or sold largely under value. And we've seen that, especially in the Gulf, Gulf states, uh, where, where basically nothing has to be paid for the land. Um, as I said, sometimes airports, <clears throat> especially regional airports in Germany, the classic example are publicly owned. If they are privately owned and get in crisis, there can be equity injections so that actually the state becomes a co-owner if an airport is in economic troubles. Um, the public financing of the infrastructure around the airport, and I will uh, now get into the specific examples. Grants, preferential loans, bailouts, uh, loan guarantees, you find everything in the airport sector, even uh, down to the subsidies of running costs like electricity. Uh, similarly, uh, airlines, we don't have our own airline any longer uh, in Slovenia, but uh, we used to have one, uh, Adria, um, it is subsidized uh, uh, in similar ways, um, through co-ownership, through loans, preferential loans, grants, uh, tax expenditure was already mentioned uh, in the presentation before, um, and, and I think very frequent in the European Union is the subsidy of airport charges that airlines have to pay, but that are either directly subsidized, and I will give one example for that, or not, not cost covering, uh, so implicitly subsidized. Uh, air traffic control uh, is an area where I don't know very much. Uh, it's typically in, in public ownership, the air traffic control, or it's a publicly owned company. Um, and of course, uh, and that is also what is uh, said in the study by Gersling that I presented before, that it's very hard sometimes to detect the subsidies in this long chain of actors because they're integrated, state-owned companies, the state, private companies, they all kind of interact and sometimes to identify and quantify the subsidies due to this uh, organizational and governance structure is, is very difficult. 
I don't want to kind of skip some not so uh, some less traditional indirect subsidies. And I think uh, the recent study by Greenpeace that compares train prices to air ticket prices is very good here. And I also have the link later on in the presentation. Uh, are things like wage dumping, weak labor laws and labor standards that make it cheap for low cost airlines to fly and actually indirectly also subsidize flying, low profit taxes. Um, it's not uh, probably by coincidence that Ryanair is operating from Ireland where the uh, profit taxes and company taxes are extremely low. And as we saw before, also the VAT is zero in Ireland. Um, this is maybe not uh, only applying to the aviation sector, but also providing an advantage internationally um, to companies in these countries. Okay, concrete uh, examples. We have an airport here in Ljubljana owned by Fraport now. Uh, it was building a new terminal uh, in 2020. Corona came, nobody flew any longer, but we had the Slovenian EU presidency upcoming and they really wanted to finish this fancy new terminal uh, and asked the government for support uh, and actually uh, got support in many different ways. Uh, not only that initially the state uh, sold the airport way too cheap to Fraport, uh, but that's another story. Um, there was a grant, Corona grant of 5 million euros. There was a preferential loan that they could make use of, of, of 12 million. And even now, uh, in the context of the energy price, uh, energy inflation and energy price crisis, um, just in the year 2022, uh, the they got granted an electricity price subsidy of a quarter million uh, just for the operation of the airport, even though uh, uh, passenger numbers are are uh, bouncing back. And um, yes, it's questionable whether this is justified. So you see, uh, in the operation of an airport, there, there are many times, even a private airport uh, subsidies involved from the state. But even when the airport is built and the infrastructure around it, um, there are many subsidies involved. So here uh, is a picture of, of Ljubljana Airport and the infrastructure around it, trail, uh, rail lines that are being planned, uh, no, new roads and connections to the motorway that are being planned. And actually, I checked the national budget and in the current budget, 1.4 million euros are only accounted for spatial planning of infrastructure around the airport. That is, of course, the spatial planning procedures are paid for by the state, um, even though there's probably a single beneficiary here. Of course, the public, you could argue, that makes use of uh, airport services also has a benefit, but uh, there's certainly a big share of the benefit from, from private companies in this case. Uh, but it doesn't stop with spatial planning. Also, all the infrastructure around the airport is, in the end, financed by public money, roads, uh, roundabouts, uh, new stations, new access to, to motorways, and so on. And the main purpose is connection to the airport. Um, interestingly, actually, this plan on the right-hand side was developed by the airport itself as a suggestion. And they said in their press release, uh, you, you should be thankful to us because we planned it in a very uh, cost-saving way for you. But you please implement it. Um, yeah, literally said. Um, another example, and uh, I know that Slovenia in the bigger context is not super relevant because we are tiny, but this state aid case is actually quite interesting because it became a reference for the corona support that was mentioned in the presentation before. So this tiny case from Slovenia was then used as a reference case to argue for uh, corona support later on. There was this big volcanic eruption on Iceland, and I don't try to pronounce the name of the volcano. Um, uh, due to that, airplanes couldn't fly for actually quite some days, or even in some countries uh, uh, more than a week. Um, other airways, uh, the state-owned carrier, or uh, at that time, um, uh, later on, privatized carrier, was already in big trouble um, and used this opportunity to then ask the state for, for a grant. And they also were granted 2 million euros uh, because of supposedly losses during these couple of days. Um, and it's a tiny airline where we're just at the edge of this cloud. Uh, so um, it's very questionable whether the actual reason uh, was the 
uh, volcano eruption or it was just the trigger. However, as I said, this case due to a, uh, an external disturbance, so this was a volcano later on, it was COVID, became a reference then for, for many, 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 many state aid schemes. Uh, most recently, um, uh, actually, we are subsidizing exactly what I mentioned before, the cost of airport charges with 50%. It's a three-year uh, scheme. New airlines or also existing airlines that offer new connections to Ljubljana Airport can get three years of state aid for e each route uh, they offer. Uh, the budget is now roughly 17 million. It's directly from the state budget. Um, and the condition for receiving this money, there are some conditions, how many people have to fly and how many connections you have to offer, but it has to be a new route. And interestingly, it also says no high speed rail should be on the same route, but at the same time, in the same sentence, they say, but anyways, we don't have any high speed rail, uh, high speed rail in Slovenia. So, so um, they kind of uh, disqualify this, this condition uh, in, in the same sentence. Um, what is very frustrating uh, to me is that this new state aid scheme went through parliament here without uh, a single vote against it, not even the left-leaning or more environmentally oriented parties saw any any problem in this, uh, this state aid, which actually really only has the purpose of more flying, uh, to put it bluntly. Uh, having said that, I think for all of you here in the call that are from a European Union country, this uh, state aid search engine is super useful if you want to look into your national uh, state aid schemes. Because in the end, uh, much is possible according to EU law, uh, so that many subsidies are actually registered in these schemes. And just go in there, uh, look for state aid cases, and then in the search uh, for your country, and then type in airport, air carrier, aircraft, or just air, and you will find, uh, I'm sure, many, many, many subsidy schemes. Similarly, I think, um, and here, uh, I think we're quite uh, a good practice case in Slovenia, uh, check your national budget. So we have one website where the whole budget is presented and every project on the budget is actually summarized. So we can filter it by many different areas. So I can very quickly find, again, um, subsidies related to airports, uh, airlines, and so on. But uh, I, I know that in many bigger countries, you don't have this bottom-up budget. We have a bottom-up budget, which means that uh, ready-made projects have to be delivered to the budget plan. So we have a very good overview of what is actually paid from the national budget. And I know that in, in several other uh, states, it's much more difficult to find these very specific uh, uh, public subsidies. Uh, with the project uh, in the Central and Eastern European countries, we are also systematically screening EU funding schemes uh, from the cohesion funds to uh, the recovery and resilience funds, modernization fund, uh, repower chapter, and so on. And uh, actually, uh, at least in our case, we could find attempts in draft documents to put uh, subsidies to the aviation sector also in these documents. So this is a third nice resource for identifying uh, aviation sector subsidies at the national level and even at an early stage before they are paid out. And feel free to also contact me or one of our colleagues uh, um, to guide you to these documents. Yes, as I said before, um, there are some sources, I think uh, most of them I've mentioned. Uh, I think some of these sources are also interesting for the future work on this topic with the network, Stay Grounded, because there are policy documents that are now allowing for lots of these subsidies, be it the state aid schemes, be it the uh, sustainable finance taxonomy that now even qualifies some uh, aviation sex sector subsidies as green. Um, and I think this could be good points of departure then for, for future advocacy work uh, on this topic. Uh, now I've, I think, uh, covered some examples from Slovenia and I have two colleagues uh, from uh, Hungary and, and Poland in the call. And uh, I would suggest then that Andras, maybe you go first uh, and, and talk a little bit about examples from, from Hungary. 
thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, okay, thank you. So I will try to sh share my screen. Okay, can you see it? Okay, so I will <clears throat> just say a few words about aviation subsidies in Hungary. Is, it, is this, are the slides moving? Yes, okay, so uh, in principle, there is a Hungary and airport development strategy. Uh, the media reported about it, but uh, it is not ac accessible. So we don't know what is, is happening with it, but uh, from time to time, the media reports about uh, certain investments or planned investments. So in Hungary, we have uh, all these airports and with uh, red uh, marked at the uh, international airports. So just some examples of uh, subsidies to uh, to regional airports. Uh, there are many more, but uh, I just pick some. So uh, one in the, uh, this is planned already uh, and already some, uh, a lot of money has been spent for uh, the planning in the uh, Southeast Hungary. Uh, and now it, it, this is approved for the expansion of uh, an international airport in uh, Eastern Hungary. Also, uh, it is, this is planned a billion of Hungarian foreign for another uh, regional airport in uh, Southern Hungary and so on. Uh, so uh, we also had, a, this is already completed, but it's a, uh, it's an example of uh, EU, of, well, EU, EIB, it's the European in, uh, Investment Bank. In fact, it is EU uh, funding uh, for uh, an airport, and it was really terrible. There was a failure to assess the climate impact. There was uh, not no proper environmental impact assessment. Uh, there was no in, in assessment of the uh, impact on air quality, and it, uh, there was a 50% uh, increase uh, uh, projected in air traffic and also in the land transport to the airport and so on. So it, it was really terrible, and this uh, investment is already completed. So now a, a, a new subsidy, practically, uh, because the Hungarian government has uh, privatized many years ago the Budapest Airport, the biggest uh, air international uh, airport in, in uh, Hungary. And now the government uh, decided to buy it back and spend an enormous amount of public money, it's estimated 600 billion forints, to buy back. And it doesn't make any really sense. It's just a waste of uh, taxpayers' money and it will just increase the public debt. But the Hungarian government is trying to, uh, to get hold of all kinds of uh, every part of the economy, and this is just a part of this. Uh, so uh, you probably know that uh, Hungary uh, does not receive now EU funding, at least from the uh, RLF and the 21-27 cohesion funds, it is, uh, these are frozen. And uh, thanks to this, a lot of uh, investments are now suspended in Hungary, including a lot of, uh, of uh, road projects. You can just see an excerpt from the list. These are the, some of the roads. In more than 250 projects are suspended which means uh, that there will be much less environmentally harmful investments. And this uh, will provide, these are uh, both uh, EU funded and national funded. And we hope that uh, uh, this uh, means that there will be much less money also for, uh, for uh, the uh, funding for airports and for aviation. And uh, in fact, uh, we are, uh, well, our organization very much supports this funding because it is our experience, the suspension of this funding or frozen of this funding, because our experience is that EU funding to Hungary 
has caused uh, much more harm to the environment and also to the economy than good, both uh, directly and indirectly. So, but to finish with uh, good news, uh, recently the Hungarian government uh, introduced a, a tax on air uh, aviation tickets. It's not a big tax, an average is about 10 euros per, per flight, and not for, yeah, not for all countries, but it's a good start in our opinion. So, thank you very much. Thanks, Andras. Um, and I think also, Wojciech, you said you could say a couple of words about the airport situation in, in, in Poland, right? Yes, hello. My name is Wojciech Szymalski. I'm working in Poland, in Warsaw, for Institute for Sustainable Development Foundation. Well, aviation is not our primary, let's say, um, interest. So uh, I'm not having a presentation and I will just say what I know from my experience and what the situation is in Poland. Uh, so the situation is that, uh, as you probably know, Poland is uh, preparing a very big uh, airport uh, investment in the center of, of Poland. Uh, it's called Central Communication Port. And um, justified from the economic point of view, right now the main, let's say, excuse for that is that um, the Warsaw Airport, current Warsaw Airport, this is a shopping airport, uh, be closed because of the development of the city and it is becoming, let's say, um, a little bit obsolete to have uh, to have so small airport and also the airport that is almost inside of the city. Uh, it's like 10 kilometers from the city center or 12, I don't remember exactly. So it's very close. And it, uh, of course, creates a lot of environmental problems and development problems for the city so the main excuse right now is this and <clears throat> but of course the um, promotion of this uh, investment is the that is going to be let's say the main polish airport uh, that will conquer also airports like berlin or monachium mission or I don't know any other big airports that are in in Poland. This is going this is going to be positioned as a re regional hub <clears throat> for flying for also uh, intercontinental flights and things like that. Um, and this uh, investment is of course not purely private. Uh, the company has been made that is a public company and um, and, and it is preparing all of that and uh, right now uh, the company is um, buying land for this and uh, and they are preparing projects uh, very let's say expensive architectural projects so to say and uh, all of that is um, I'm I'm not I'm not sure, but I'm quite uh, <clears throat> certain that it's mostly public money, because it's a public-owned uh, company. Mm. Uh, but it's also a, a company that is let's say linked to the Polish airports company, and that is uh, an owner of the shopping airport. Uh, and uh, but but all all of this uh, are are let's say public owned companies so so it's all like in the hands of the of the um, uh, of the state budget what to do with it so that's that's one of the thing well the uh, second thing is that uh, the government is directing a little bit of EU money to this company um uh, because uh, the airport that i've told you about is not is it's it's not only to be an airport it's going to be a communication hub 
So a communication hub, it's also railways and it's also some roads. Uh, so they are uh, at least directing some EU money for the design of the railways and maybe also for the build of the railways and all the, for example, like a train station or things like that. Also to this company. Well, but uh, okay, in the end, it, it may uh, be that uh, not all of that will be so clearly explain that it's fully 100% for that purpose. Um, so so that's that's the situation uh, right now. But of course, in the past, uh, there were uh, just like in Hungary, uh, there was uh, in uh, European Union um, uh, funding uh, period 2007-2013, there was of course a very big um investment in airports in on the regional ex, uh, airports just as in Hungary so I don't remember the let's say numbers but uh almost every region in Poland have now its its own new airport and not all of them are fully profitable at all well most of them have like one, two flights in a day or maybe less. Uh, so it's very, uh, very unprofitable. And so many of them uh, receive because of that right now, some kind of, uh, let's say, local uh, authorities are aiding it uh, in a different forms. Like in Lubuskie region, there were, and there probably still are, um additional funds to fund simply the flights like from Zielona Góra to Warsaw uh in some other <clears throat> regions well they give different kind of donations just to uh, make the airport let's say working because it's a little bit like a matter of a let's say um uh prestige to have a airport uh and uh, and let's say these are these are the most let's say the biggest things that uh, that have been done. I don't know what was done, how the uh, let's say um, the companies, Polish company, if uh, if it was. Uh, um, I know that they had problems after COVID with the uh, with the money, but I don't know if they got some state. They probably did. But I don't. I I'm not sure of it. So uh, so let's say this is like the, the situation in 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 Poland. Of course, we don't. We are not. Uh, let's say very active uh, in the in this sector. But we we do a lot uh, to uh, to make it bigger to grow it from the public money. Thanks a lot for, for those two really interesting um, inputs on, on situations in Hungary and in Poland. And thanks a lot, uh, Jonas and Roman, for your um, inputs on, on subsidies. I have the feeling that we just scratched the surface of all existing subsidies um, and that it can come from so many different uh, ways and places. Uh, Seems like a, an endless job. Um, so right now we are gonna open a little uh, the discussion. Um, so with three different topics that I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the of the webinar. The first one would be direct questions for for uh, one of the four uh, speakers that you just heard. Um, and then we would like you, if you want to share an uh, example of subsidies from your country, if you if you want to. And then if you think about like more specific strategic questions that we could um, that we could um, dig into uh, for next uh, for our next webinar or for like a, a coordinated uh, work inside the inside stay grounded. Um, so for that, as Eric uh, started doing, uh, it's it's perfect. Uh, you can put stars in the chat or raise your hand with one of the uh, reaction uh, possible in Zoom. 
And if you want to write directly uh, your, your examples or your questions, uh, we created a Jamboard. So there is a link that I just sent you. You can click, click on it. And then in the Jamboard, you can double click either on subsidy or question um, to write your, your input. Uh, you can also write something and ask a question, like you don't have to choose. Um, and then I, I guess I will give the, the word to you, Eric, for our first question. Thank you, Lunes. Uh, so I'm Eric from Resté uh, sur Terre in France. Um, so uh, we, uh, we have been uh, assessing the, uh, the loss in uh, public finance due to the tax ex exemptions, uh, mainly uh, the kerosene tax and the, the VAT. And so it's relatively easy to, uh, to assess for the kerosene tax, uh, not that easy for, VA, for VAT. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised and I, uh, that uh, t and &E, uh, &E only uh, um, finds uh, uh, an exemption of 4.7 uh, uh, billion uh, euros. Uh, because because we uh, <clears throat> our calculation shows that the uh, kerosene tax exemption is about seven uh, billion euros, not four point seven. And so I I had some discussions with Jerome uh, in in France and told me that uh, the two main reasons were that uh, T and E uh, has taken the minimum uh, tax rate uh, that is uh, planned in the in the frame of ETD. Which is about 37 cents per liter. Uh, whereas in France, we base our calculation on the tax rate for, uh, for car fuel, for, for, uh, for gasoline or, or diesel, uh, which is uh, much more, which is between 50 and 60 cents per liter. And the other reason is that, um, in, at least in France, I don't know in other countries, but you may check the uh, kerosene tax. Uh, when applied is submitted to VAT. So with a 20% rate in, in yeah. France, that adds a lot to, uh, to the exemption. Um, I can take this uh, question, of course. Um, so thank you very much for your question. And we can also um, lay up uh, directly if you want to have a discussion on this. Uh, so what we did in tax gap is that our no exemption scenario is applying the uh, sorry uh, jet fuel tax on all departing flights so we are not only in the intra-eu scope as proposed today in the etd energy taxation directive but we extended to all departing flights because it's only fair to do this and we kept the full rate proposed by the commission which is 38 cents and so uh, as you said we find that the tax exemption is 10.7 billion per year um, and we did not yeah to answer your question we did not apply VAT on the fuel so it's, it would be likely to be even higher if we did mm. and so we could also question a uh, uh, work uh, why did we use the 38 cents whilst you know uh, car users uh, have a tax rate of 50 or 60 cents it would be only fair that aviation pays the same uh, we we chose this assumption to remain in the frame of current negotiations on the energy taxation directive uh, so to also you know feed the, the the discussion directly when we are negotiating with the member states but i i agree that this rate should be ultimately much higher thank you maybe i can add one thought about v80 um, because we also tried to calculate that 10 years ago already for Slovenia, the VAT exemption or reduced rate. And I think for all of you who want to do that, don't be tempted if there is a 10% rate on aviation services and otherwise the full rate is 20 just to double the potential income because much of the aviation is actually business to business. And of course, here the uh, value added tax will be passed on. So, so. In addition to doubling it, you have to reduce it then by the share of, of business aviation in the overall uh, consumption of, of aviation uh, air travel services. This is just one kind of short technical 
reminder for those of you who want to do it at the national level. Thanks a lot. Is there like uh, other questions or, or uh, examples from your countries? Okay, are you sure? Yeah, I, I can add a um, point to, the, uh, to what um, uh, what um, uh, Jonas just uh, said is uh, for VAT, yes, it's extremely difficult to uh, make an assessment. Um, and uh, um, I, try, <laughs> I tried it, uh, and, uh, uh, but I, I didn't. Succeed and uh, so TNE, &E, uh, TNE, &E, I think for France evaluated the the, the tax gap uh, to, to be about two uh, two billion uh, euros. And um, there was another there was a research institute in France, i 4 ce that made another estimate. They found less than one billion. Uh, so I think the, the truth uh, I think is closer to what TNE &E, uh, found about two. Two billion uh, euros, which is much less than the, the gap on, on the kerosene the kerosene tax. Uh, that's a really the the elephant in the room is uh, is uh, the kerosene tax, um, and uh, you you may also compare this tax gap with the ticket tax because uh, uh, several countries have a ticket tax. Um, in France, we have a, we have one which is very small. And the government plans to increase it uh, in the next uh, in the next uh, next year, and but they say they will increase it by hundred million uh, euros, which is very small compared to this tax gap of seven. Uh, so according to us, seven million uh, seven billion uh, euros. So uh, we we have a, a real uh, good arguments to to say that. Uh, the plan, the government plan, is not is not uh, on scale at scale. Thanks for this input, um, Ton. You're you're still muted, Ton. You think we should know by now, right? <laughs> <laughs> um. I have two points. One is uh, on the, um, the VAT calculation. Um, if if you just look at how much how much um, kerosene is sold and how many tickets are sold, then you should be able to calculate how much uh, VAT would be generated. And that then maybe. You know, some of the uh, VAT is passed on to the next and the next and the next business. In the end, somebody pays. So uh, that, that shouldn't concern us. But more importantly, I was wondering, um, so now we have all this information on all the, the subsidies. And what is then a good strategic route to uh, to work with this? How how are we going to um, get into this into the public debate and uh, the the political debate and where are um, the chances to to work with this? Yeah, I can take this one. Uh, thank you very much, Don. Uh, on the VAT, just to give you some specifics on how we calculated it and maybe this this is why also we have we find different results uh, depending on every analysis uh, what rate do you use so we chose an average of 20 percent uh, but that could be different uh, yeah it's, it's very arbitrary which rate you use because uh, the minimal uh, rates in the VAT directive is 15 percent so you know 
just depends which one you use. And also when we ana analyze VAT on intra-European uh, flights, we chose to apply, um, for example, if you have an indirect flight with, with two segments, we, we applied VAT on the tickets. But um, the member state which levies the VAT is the one where the journey started. So just to, to specify this. And on what we do now, um, that is a really good question on how we can, uh, you know, uh, influence the debate more. We can do demonstrations. We can do much more, uh, you know, uh, be active on social media to, you know, promote the, the tax gap report we did uh, as much as possible. I know that when we did the media work, we had a lot of audience in the Netherlands, uh, in Belgium as well. But you know, it just depends on also the policy context. Um, I think that in southern member states, uh, this question of uh, pricing aviation better is a bit more difficult because uh, you know, uh, in the end, you increase the ticket prices for citizens as well. And for citizens that really rely on aviation for their connectivity in their day, daily life, it can be a, a touchy subject. So yeah, there's a difference between you know every policy de debate and context. Yeah, maybe I can jump in just on the second question, and I think this is a question for the wider network to discuss. Maybe also at a at a future meeting. Um, I think also in the chat now and in the question and answer, it becomes clear that there's still a lack of data. I mean, I gave some illustrating examples and we have lots of data on tax spending expenditure, not so much on the nitty gritty smaller uh, subsidies along the whole chain, a summary of all the state aid that has been granted to airports, to airlines and so on. Some data is existing, but I don't think it has been kind of compiled. And then for me, communicating the message, hey, we're subsidizing something that is just used by a few. Um, and uh, usually by the, the richer part of the population is maybe a message to, to, to place. Um, bearing in mind that, of course, there are ways to also still enable mobility for people that are on remote islands and so on. So, so yeah, but maybe the, the, the main message is, hey, this is a social question and we're pumping for decades money into the system on all ends. Question from Sarah. Yeah, thanks everyone for this interesting um, yeah, insight into the subsidies. I was thinking as at Take Run, we are also currently having a focus on private jets. It would have been interesting also to look at those because uh, if I'm not mistaken, private jets are, for instance, uh, exempt from um, the EU um, emission trading system because of their size and so on, or I think it's depending on size and or rate, I'm not entirely sure. So I think that would also be interesting to look at. Um, yeah, and I think a general remark also when like, what do we do with these numbers and how do we make them more tangible and useful in communication? I think uh, also for me personally, it would have been great to see a comparison with another sector or with something where we could see like there could be meaningful subsidies, for instance, in the health sector or something, educational sector, just to give these number also a comparison. Um, yeah. Thanks a lot for the remark. Um, I, I can say that you know our office in TNE, uh, in in uh, in France, focuses a lot on private jets, and they made some calculations on how uh, how much revenues we could generate by taxing uh, private jets in France. Um, it's it was less of a focus in our Brussels-based uh, bureau, but you know I take your comments, and also um, comparison with the sector. Also take your comment. I think we what we can do also. Is compare from VAT with international rail, where VAT applies, and we could very well do an analysis on this. Okay, if um, there is no more question or remark or example of subsidies um, I suggest that we uh, close uh, this this first webinar on subsidies I, I hope you um, enjoyed and and, uh, and got a lot of information. Up, please 
Yes, of course. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah. Uh, Steve from Rising Tide UK. Uh, since Finley hasn't mentioned it, um, uh, we're getting uh, an increasing amount of information in the UK that the UK government is moving towards what they call a contracts for difference approach towards SAF production. Um, so that's uh, if if the contracts for difference um, option follows the one for electricity production. So say for example, uh, nuclear powered electricity, it will be a fixed price for the production of fuel contract with the government to supply over a set period of time. Uh, uh, at the moment, the nuclear one is a guaranteed set price over a 40 year contract. Um, so uh, when we get any further information about that, we'll obviously let everybody know and our spam machine will be in full blast operation. But that looks like what, what, what they're moving towards for SAF production. And of course, they're also um, going to be subsidising that SAF production by um, producing advanced so-called small modular nuclear reactors to produce SAF. Uh, and hydrogen as well, separately. So just to flag that up, so people are aware that that development in the UK. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I've, I've started to look into this instrument and what's very interesting is that the DOT has really underlined that it should be industry financed. So it will not be taxpayers' money, it will be you know somehow recycling some revenues from the sector to support SAF producers. But it's still a very open question because I think in six months time, there will be an open uh, consultation where stakeholders will be able to you know, provide some ideas of how to design this instrument. Can I just um, make a quick observation, a very non-technical one. I imagine there's zero impulse from the bottom up on on um, putting pressure on governments to, to do anything about this. You know, everybody loves their cheap flights, particularly in the UK. There's, you know, there's there's a kind of perfect symmetry, government inertia and, and um, you know, to, to kind of subsidise the sector plus public resistance apathy inertia to to do to to complain protest object there's, there's just nothing there you're kind of in a vacuum and i just i suppose i just find it very confounding and disturbing that we're we're kind of us people people like us are kind of caught between those two pincer points i just don't see how we get traction on this really i don't know if there's a precedent anywhere out there but it feels an enormous task to try and get any serious leverage with this. Yeah, I I think you're completely right. So <laughs> um, I think there are some narratives that you can try that can resonate with some people. Um, I think in some countries, maybe also the skepticism towards the state uh, can help somehow to avoid further subsidies into state-owned parts of this aviation sector, right? So this could be one kind of where we use this mental disconnect. Okay, skepticism to the state here, we still like our cheap flights, but maybe people will support that uh, state institutions that are insufficient and environmentally damaging will will receive further subsidies. So I think that, but otherwise, I'm yeah, it's a big puzzle. Um, yeah, I just wanted to tell you that um, in the Netherlands, um, we have managed to find the data on who is actually flying and how much, and then also looking at the 10 different income groups. And you can see that the uh, people who are poor are just not flying. 
50% of the people in the last five years have not flown. More than half of all the flights have been taken by only 17% of uh, the, the people. That's for a uh, non, non, um, so that's for holiday flights and, and individual flights, not for, for company flights. If you look at all the flights, 8% of the people are responsible for 40% of the flights. So if you are now are going to have um, governments starting to subsidize uh, soft production, it's no longer the pollution, the polluter who pays, because they should green themselves. They have given so much money to uh, all the stakeholders, um, uh, um, no, not stakeholders, but the um, shareholders, and they should use some of that money to buy uh, their own paid for sustainable aviation shoots. And if the government is going to subsidize that, that will mean that the poor people will subsidize the rich people. And it's an, an enormous scandal. And it is not only for aviation, it's for all fossil fuel subsidies. In the Netherlands, last Saturday, there were 20,000 people protesting it. And XR uh, is already blocking a um, major artery into The Hague, our political capital, for every day last week, just to claim that these subsidies, to these fossil subsidies should stop. Because it's all payments from poor people to rich people. Thank you, Tan. Um... I see we're already approaching the, the end of the webinar. So maybe we can have the question from Callum and then as a last reaction of your two remarks by Roman and Jonas. Great, thanks. Yeah, sorry, I'll keep it brief. Um, thanks to, to everyone who's spoken actually. It's been really great, kind of really interesting. Loads of great examples. Um, and I think definitely keen to continue the discussion of, of how we kind of operate, you know, turn this into campaigns, how we leverage this stuff and actually uh, make change. My one additional thought was just that we've heard a, a lot about uh, public subsidies in the, in the form of government subsidies. And I think the other, the other kind of side is public subsidies in the form of things like frequent flyer programs and frequent flyer miles, which are public in the sense that through all sorts of credit card payments and the general economy um, you get the broader public subsidizing air miles for again a select few of people who are members of these frequent flyer programs um yeah i don't, don't well, there's definitely not time to go into any detail but i think that's something that's definitely a big issue in the us the uk to a small degree australia certainly has a massive uh, intense relationship with uh, air miles um, but that's, I guess, yeah, and maybe another dimension of subsidies that come from the broader economy that are, as John says, from the from ev from the poor people or from everyone to a very select, rich uh, kind of group of society. Um, but yeah, anyway, thanks. Thanks a lot, Callum. Uh, it's something I'm less familiar, uh, but it's very interesting to hear your thoughts, uh, and I took it good note of it. Thank you. Yeah, I also agree, and I think as as you already wrote, also Stay Ground is already partly working on this frequent flying and frequent flying programs to to lobby against them, uh, which I agree with very much. Um, maybe reacting one thing to Tom, I think on a factual basis, that is completely right, and I think we could find similar things for for many member states. Um, I think the risk is still there that we will face populistic arguments that are not based on facts saying, okay, you're taking away our cheap flights, right? So, so this is something on a non-factual basis that we have to deal with and have to have a strategy to deal with just so much. Um, but I completely agree that on a, on a completely factual basis, this is a non-issue. It would be socially completely great 
to tax aviation higher and increase prices. But yeah. Great, thank you for this uh, uh, last questions. Uh, I guess we can now close this uh, first webinar on subsidies. Don't uh, hesitate to give us feedback uh, to also, if you think about a uh, strategic question that we uh, should take care of uh, for um, webinar number two, having other questions, um, you can still contact us. Um, and I thank everyone, uh, our our speakers, of course, but everyone that joined today. And I wish you a really good afternoon. Thank you, everyone.